Hello, New Hope. It's Pastor Weaver here. If you're visiting with us, um, started the church be 30 years this October, first weekend of October. We're going to celebrate that 30 year anniversary, and and uh, I'm co-pastoring with Pastor Jeff, that was elected a senior pastor, and I kind of call myself the senior pastor, founder pastor. You know, I'm more like the founding pastor. And boy, Pastor Jeff is doing a great job, and all the other pastors, we're proud of them. You guys are doing a great job. We were able to send two containers to El Salvador after that missions offering to help feed the starving there through the ministry of our missionary Don Triplett. And uh, yeah, $15,000. Way to go, church. You're being faithful in giving. You're being faithful in giving to benevolence. We've helped um, to several thousand dollars this past week, and it was there because of your goodness, helping people in great need. Listen, in great need, and thank you. What a joy it is to be able to carry that out <laughs> and to, to be a part of that. What a great church you are. And I wanted to share a word with you tonight. Oh, before I do, I want to mention that we have this drive-through in our parking lot on the 4th of July at 10 o'clock. And we're calling it a parade, but if it's going to be a parade, you got to decorate your cars and drive through. Some of us will be all dressed up with characters and, you know, 4th of July gear and all that kind of stuff. Passing out bundles of candy and playing music. You can tune it in on your radio and crank them up, or we'll have maybe music outdoors. And, and so, you know, you'll see the post about that. You can share it and invite your neighbors. It's okay to bring them their kids. Well, you know, since they're, we don't have the Fort July Parade in the street, nobody's going to get the original candy and kids get excited. They're going to be disappointed. So we're trying to fill a hole and love our neighborhood, love our city, love the surrounding area. So anyone, anywhere, they can drive through and uh, we're going to bless them all that, all we can and pray for our nation, will you? We, we, we need it. Keep praying. And, uh, and let's be the church. Let's be salt and let's be light. And let's stand up for the rights of all people, regardless of, uh, of, their, of their race, uh, even their religion. Let's respect uh, the Muslims and Jews. Pray for them and love them and show them Jesus' love and win a right to be heard and in relationship. Let's give them the truth of Jesus Christ. Let's be the church. Let's be so unique. Let's be outside the natural man to the supernatural man of Jesus Christ living in us so that we can give water to drink to the one that has never tasted of the love of Jesus Christ and the spirit of God Almighty. Let's be the church. Rise on up. So I want to share a word from two Old Testament scriptures tonight. And I ask Jesus right now that you would anoint them and let us receive and hear and receive from you in Christ's name. Amen. And they're Deuteronomy 10, 12 and Micah 6, 8. You probably know Micah 6, 8 if you know scripture very well. It's a famous verse. And both of these scriptures have interpreted two different Hebrew words, a different Hebrew word in, in Deuteronomy 10, 12. And another word, Hebrew word, in Micah 6, 8. And we've, when we've interpreted it and written it in Scripture in English, we use the word require. And it's not exactly that. So to give you a better understanding, the Hebrews, I mean, not the Hebrews, the Deuteronomy. And I say Hebrews, it's Deuteronomy 10, 12. The Deuteronomy 10, 12 verse that we interpret and write the word require from that original Hebrew word is actually what he asked of us, what he ask us to pursue, what he wants us to desire, what he wants us to, to go after, what he asks us to do. What is the Lord asking you to do when he says what the Lord requires? He asks this of us. And then the Micah 6, 8 verse is actually demands. He says what the Lord requires, what does he demand? It's a stronger word. And there's a reason for that because the Micah 6, 8 gets at a very basic attitude and perspective about how we think about God, what we think about things that are going on, uh, how we feel about things going on, how we see life through God's eyes and how we view things. And if we don't have what God demands in place, we'll never be there. So God is saying, here's what I'm asking. Here's what I'm asking in Deuteronomy 10, 12. Here's what I'm demanding in Micah 6, 8. So here's, here's the, the verses as I read these two verses. And this is Deuteronomy 10, 12. And now Israel, the people of God, so you are the people of God. What does the Lord your God require of you or ask of you? But to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all of his ways, to love him, to serve the Lord, 
the God with all your heart, with all your soul, and to keep the commandments and statutes of the Lord. So the first thing we see ask of us is that we fear the Lord. Why the fear of the Lord? Because it's a basic precept that God says, well, look, I'm your God and you're my people, the sheep of my pasture. I'm God. I made heaven and earth. I'm God. And you need to fear God. Well, we think of fear as like, I'm afraid of you. Well, <clears throat> there's an element of that, but that's not what he's really saying. He's saying re respect and reverence and understand he's an awesome God. Uh, and understand this, this is the good way to look at it, to take God seriously, what he says seriously. So if you don't begin with taking God seriously, well, how are you going to like listen to what he says and follow his commandments and follow his ways? So the first thing he says is to, to fear the Lord. And, and, and so what does the fear of the Lord do for you? Well, it says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. If you fear God, you take God seriously, you're going to have wisdom. And we all need wisdom, and God's the one that gives the wisdom. And it begins when you take him seriously. He will pour it into your heart. Because what does wisdom do? The Bible teaches very clearly wisdom is the application of knowledge. You know what is right and wrong. Wisdom will make you apply it. Without wisdom, you'll just know what's right and wrong, and you'll just do what's wrong, or whatever is convenient for you in the moment. You know, If it benefits you to do something right, you'll do it. If it benefits you to do something wrong, you'll do it. But the fear of the Lord says, you know, guess what? When I know right and wrong, I'm going to do everything I can to apply it. I'm going to use my wisdom, and I'm going to obey God and do what is right. So the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Wisdom applies knowledge. And the Bible says the fear of the Lord. Why is it all so good to start there? Take God seriously? Because it says the fear of the Lord gives you the attitude God has, which he hates sin. He hates evil. The fear of the Lord is another verse in the Proverbs. It says is to run from evil or to run from sin, to turn, get away from it. Don't get, don't be a partaker of it, to understand the power of it, to understand how God hates sins, the Bible says, and what it does to man. You know why God hates sin? Because it hurts people. You don't think lying and cheating and stealing and, and adultery and, and, and uh, pornography and uh, racism and civil and, you know, injustice, do you think not, you think any of that stuff doesn't hurt people? Of course it does. Sin hurts people, guys. So the fear of the Lord is to hate sin, to run from sin, to hate evil. Satan is the author of all evil. He's a liar. He's come to steal, kill, and destroy. And we need we need to we need to have the fear of the Lord in our life. And it's reverencing him, it's a desire to walk in holiness, it's to see his awesome holiness. So that fear of the Lord is the first thing that we see that we have to, that he asks of us in Deuteronomy 10, 12. The next thing you see in that verse is that we walk in all of his ways. That we walk in all of his ways in obedience. That is to obey every command in the statute of the Lord. To walk in his holiness, his truth, his purity is what he's saying. To walk in his ways. So we have to put our, put our foot there. We have to try. With your fear of the Lord says, you know, put, put your effort there. Paul says, put off and put on. Put off the old man, put on the new man. He says this, the Bible tells us to be vigilant and to be vigilant and be alert, to be sober, because we have an enemy. The devil is coming after us to destroy us. The Bible says that we should hide the word in our heart that we not sin against God. That's what David did. So, and to, and to dwell and to, to meditate on his law, the law of day and night. I mean, there's so many things it tells us to do, to pursue. God and to live holy. Pastor Jeff mentioned the importance of Jesus's words about following and living out the commands of God because it's like building your house on a rock. What a great message. And not building your house on the sand so it washes away. So he asked us to walk into all of his ways and, and to not live to not live half-hearted. The next thing is to, to love and serve God with all your heart and soul, mind, and strength. You serve God by working for God. You serve God with your talents, but you serve God with working, whether it's mowing lawn, changing diapers, Serving with your gifts, teaching, serving with singing, serving with music, instrumentation. Serve God. Everything you do, serve God. Encouraging people, exhorting people, praying with people, visiting widows, visiting the prisons, all this. Serving God with all your heart, loving. Make life about that, not about amusement. The word amuse means to not think. And we want to just pass the time and not think. Listen, life is serious because it is a serious consequence. We're headed toward death and we're going to be somewhere in eternity. And God's the one that we should fear because he's going to decide what, who are goats and who are sheep and send us appropriately. 
And we have people that need Jesus. Listen, people we love, friends, neighbors, relatives. We, we, need, we need to fear the Lord and we need to take him seriously. And we need to work, serve God, fight for God, fight for the things of God with all of our heart in the, in the realm of the spirit through prayer on our knees. So that's what we do. Serve the Lord with all of our heart, it says, to love him and serve him. Not half-heartedly, but have no divided heart all the way. And so this is what he asks of us. He asks us that. But then what does he demand? In Micah 6, 8, the first thing he demands is to love justice. I, there's injustice in our land, folks, period. And protesters, most of them, it appears to me, that most of them are protesting injustice and there are opportunists that come along and they do things that are criminal and they break windows and they burn things and they steal things. That's not the heart of, of, of protesting racial injustice. And please don't throw them all in the same boat. Don't broad brush all the protesters as, as people that are criminals. At the same time, while police officers have done things that are not acceptable, that are horrible, and we see this from time to time. We've seen it enough to know that this is a problem throughout our country. Please don't, please don't take that same brush and broad brush all the police officers into the same category, okay? Police officers I know are great people, and I love them, and I've prayed for them for years, almost every day. But it doesn't mean there's not a problem with some police officers. But the police officers that serve with dignity will tell you they're the first ones to disapprove of that type of behavior where anyone is, uh, is hated or, you know, profiled or whatever else. So just be aware of that, okay? America needs change because uh, there's injustice. And God loves justice. We've all experienced injustice in different ways, and some ways are worse than others. My ways are minor compared to what other people have considered. I don't know what it's like to have black skin and be followed in a store because I'm black, thinking they're going to I'm going to steal something. I don't know what it is to like to have black skin to peek into a, a, a building and and see if I left something in there and think if I'm black, I'm thinking you know what somebody's going to call in. I'm going I'm going to you know, be treated like a criminal because of my skin. And I'm not saying that happens all the time. I'm just saying it happens. And uh, I don't know what it's like. And I, I want to listen and understand and know more. But injustice has to stop. We need to love justice. And guess what? God is a just God, and he's the one that will judge. We don't need to judge. And it's not our place to judge. Judge not lest you be judged. We need to show mercy, which is the next thing that God wants is to show mercy. Love mercy. Not just show it, but love it. Be merciful even as God is merciful, it says. And you'll be judged the way you judge. If you judge harshly, you'll be judged. So let's not judge others. When I'm talking about judging others, I'm not judging them, damning them, hating them, you know, wishing they were in hell, wishing they were dead, uh, you know, all that kind of stuff. And, uh, you know, we don't know all the facts all the time, do we? We don't. And we make judgments too fast. Now, to use judgments different. You know, when you make friends or you marry someone or you hire someone, you got to use judgment. That's not judging someone. That's a different thing. The Bible even says, by their fruits, you'll know them. You can see clearly. And But when you do that, listen, speak truth. Truth with love makes change. Truth without love is religion and law, and it, and it only makes people mad and angry and, and never going to impact them. And love with no truth is nothing but humanism. It's never going to impact anybody. We need truth and love spoken out of relationship to make a difference in our world. And we've got to do it from a point of loving justice, I mean, doing justice, but also loving mercy. Because I need mercy. I didn't know, that. I've made mistakes. I need mercy. You need mercy. Everybody needs mercy. Everybody needs mercy. Even the vilest sinner needs mercy. We need to pray God, have mercy have mercy on their soul and that we need to give them Jesus and offer them the opportunity to be forgiven. We know godly people that throughout history have done murder 
and other things that are horrible. They were in blindness. They were in evil. They were caught with the trap of Satan. But somehow they woke up. They cried out to God. They got saved and they turned around. Now they're preaching the gospel and they're living godly lives and they're making an impact. This can happen. So never damn any person, no matter how evil they are. Don't damn them to hell. Let God be the judge. Let God bring justice and love mercy and pray for their soul and pray for the soul of our nation, will you? To do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly before our God. You know, God resists the proud. He gives grace to the humble. There's no person that can be right with God if they're proud. In fact, when you, when you, when you go before the power and the presence of God, and you know when you encounter God, you're going to do the same thing some of the people did in, in the Old Testament. Just think with me about that. Isaiah, when he saw a vision of God, he goes, woe is me, I'm a man of unclean lips. That's what we do. That's, that's humility. When Daniel saw God, he said this, my beauty was turned into corruption. In other words, I thought myself okay. I thought myself beautiful. But when I was face to face with God, I saw my sinfulness and my corruption. That's what the presence of God will do. You know, when you get in the presence of God, you say, woe is me. You say, God, I'm a sinner. God, I can't change myself. I need you to do it. I, I see my selfishness. I see that everything I see is through my eyes and I cannot empathize with others. I cannot understand others. I cannot walk in their shoes. I cannot, I don't even care to listen to understand their plight. And I want to be a person, God, that is humble, that knows that in me, there's layer of layer upon layer of things that need to be washed clean and dug out. Things where I can be more like you, God, growing from glory to glory in your light, being transformed by the renewing of my mind day by day, being conformed to the image of Christ by his spirit and by his word so that I become more like you, Lord Jesus. Listen, without humility, that doesn't happen. But on the other hand, don't go Oh, well, I'll never be perfect. It's okay. That, that's not okay. We, we need God. We can live right. We don't have to live direct in sin. But also, don't, don't think there's not areas in your life that don't need to be scrubbed and cleaned up. Be humble, okay? Ask God. Ask God. Show your heart. Teach me. See if there be, see if, look into my heart. See if there's any wicked way in me. You know, create a clean heart in me, oh God. Renew a right spirit in me, oh God. Deal with me, God. Let me think the way you think. Help me, God. And that's what, that's what the Lord demands of us. Do justice. Be fair. Whether you're coaching Little League or whether you're a pastor to your congregation, be fair. Whether you're a, a businessman, be fair. Don't judge a person by the color of their skin when you decide a job. Be fair. Whether you're an officer of the law, be fair, right? Because injustice is wrong on every arena, it's particularly if it's just about the color of someone's skin. That is just so wrong, so wrong. I know I've, I've experienced, and this is not even close to the same, but I've experienced people hating me because I'm a pastor, curse me out because they hate ministers. They hate the church. And no matter what I would do or say, they're not ever going to listen to me. They're not going to accept me. They're going to hate me. You're all the same, they say. They start cursing me and calling me names and accusing me. That's painful. That is painful. And unfortunately, growing up in the South, I witnessed huge racism, words of hate, degrading a person because of the color of their skin. And it, it breaks my heart. It breaks my heart. My dad taught me that a man is to be evaluated by their character. Skin color has nothing to do with it. Their job, their position in life has nothing to do with it. Whether they're a man or a woman, old or young, handicapped, doesn't matter. Listen, every value, every human being is valued. I'm so thankful my dad got that somehow. I'm, I am. I'm, I'm glad he did. 
but even with that, just living in our culture, you know, I know there's blind spots with me that I don't really understand. I, I can't understand because I'm not, I don't have black skin. I don't understand it. But I love people. I love them every color. I love every one of our black members. I love people that aren't members of our church that are black. I love people that are sinners. I love people that are homosexuals. I love people that are living in adultery. I love people that hate me. It's supernatural. And we need love. We need truth. We need relationship and to speak relationship. And we need to learn to listen. And we need to really have the right perspective and attitude that God gives us about understanding to do justice ourselves with everything within us, to love mercy and be merciful, and to be humble before God, knowing that we don't have it all together either. We need, we all need God. Would you pray with me? Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray right now that you forgive us our sins, that you would help us, God. Help us, Lord, to fear you, to walk in wisdom, to follow all the commandments and statutes of the Lord, to take you seriously, God, to serve you with all of our heart, to give our lives to serve you and not give our lives just to be amused and be entertained. And God, that we'd make a difference in the world, that we'd be full of your spirit, that we'd apply ourselves to, to the word of God and to prayer. Lord, that we'd be full of your spirit and be powerful, God. I pray you would help us, Lord, to, to love justice, to do justice, to treat everyone fair, God, through your eyes, God. Thank you for it, Lord. I know I know that's our hearts. I know that's our hearts, God. And to uh, pray for the people that have hard jobs in our culture that are just hard. I mean, school teaching now is really hard too. There's every area of life is a little bit more difficult right now. And I just pray, God, you'd help them do that. Help our pastors, God. And uh, help us not help to, to rid out any speck of any kind of racism that might hide lurking somewhere and help us, God, to listen and understand and have empathy and compassion on everybody from everyone that we meet, God. And Lord, help us to speak up when we hear the words of hate, words of racism, to speak up with love and truth and try to influence a person to change their views. And I pray, God, that we would walk humbly before you, God, truly walk humbly before you, God, and, uh, and be merciful to people, everybody. Really be merciful. Help us, Jesus, we pray in your name. Amen. I just thank you, God, for you again. And, um, and please hear my heart. So many people have a tendency to go, what is, who, do you th who does he think we are? And trust me, I think you're great. I just want to speak truth. It needs to be spoken, and this is truth. And it, it applies here to our current event, but listen, this, this scripture applies to every area of life. So live it out, guys. Let's be the church. Live it out, okay? God bless you. Talk to you later.